Chapter 6, Part 5 of An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. By Thomas Reed. Chapter 6, Part 5. Section 19 of Dr. Briggs' Theory and Sir Isaac Newton's Conjecture on this subject. I am afraid the reader, as well as the writer, is already tired of the subject of single and double vision. The multitude of theories advanced by authors of great name, and the multitude of facts observed without sufficient skills in optics, or related without attention to the most material and decisive circumstances, have equally contributed to perplex it. In order to bring it to some issue, I have in the thirteenth section given a more full and regular deduction than had been given heretofore of the phenomena of single and double vision, in those whose sight is perfect, and have traced them up to one general principle, which appears to be a law of vision in human eyes that are perfect, and in their natural state. In the fourteenth section I have made it appear that this law of vision, although excellently adapted to the fabric of the human eye, cannot answer the purposes of vision in some other animals and therefore, very probably, is not common to all animals. The purpose of the fifteenth and sixteenth sections is to inquire whether there be any deviation from this law of vision in those who squint, a question which is of real importance in the medical art, as well as in the philosophy of vision, but which after all hath been observed and written on this subject seems not to be ripe for a determination for want of proper observations. Those who have had skill to make proper observations have wanted opportunities, and those who have had opportunities have wanted skill or attention. I have therefore thought it worth while to give a distinct account of the observations necessary for the determinations of this question, and what conclusions may be drawn from the facts observed. I have likewise collected and set in one view the most conclusive facts that have occurred in authors, or have fallen under my own observation. It must be confessed that these facts, when applied to the question in hand, make a very poor figure, and the gentlemen of the medical faculty are called upon for the honour of their profession, and for the benefit of mankind, to add to them. All the medical and all the optical writers, upon the strabismus that I have met with except Dr. Juren, either affirm or take it for granted that squinting persons see the object with both eyes, and yet see it single. Dr. Juren affirms that squinting persons never see the object with both eyes, and that if they did, they would see it double. If the common opinion be true, the cure of a squint would be as pernicious to the sight of the patient as the causing of a permanent squint would be to one who naturally has no squint, and therefore no physician ought to attempt such a cure. No patient ought to submit to it. But if Dr. Juren's opinion be true, most young people that squint may cure themselves by taking some pains, and may not only remove the deformity, but at the same time improve their sight. If the common opinion be true, the centers and other points of the two retinae, in squinting persons, do not correspond as in other men, and nature in them deviates from her common rule. But if Dr. Juren's opinion be true, there is reason to think that the same general law of vision which we have found in perfect human eyes extends also to those which squint. It is impossible to determine by reasoning which of these opinions is true, or whether one may not be found true in some patients and the other in others. Here experience and observation are our only guides, and a deduction of instances is the only rational argument. 
It might therefore have been expected that the patrons of the contrary opinions should have given instances, in support of them, that are clear and indisputable. But I have not found one such instance, in either side of the question, and all the authors I have met with. I have given three instances from my own observation, in confirmation of Dr. Juran's opinion, which admit of no doubt, and one which leans rather to the other opinion, but is dubious. And here I must leave the matter for further observation. In the seventeenth section I have endeavoured to shew that the correspondence and sympathy of certain points of the two retinae, into which we have resolved all the phenomena of single and double vision, is not, as Dr. Smith conceived, the effect of custom, nor can be changed by custom, but is a natural and original property of human eyes. And in the last section, that it is not owing to an original and natural perception of the true distance of objects from the eye, as Dr. Porterfield imagined. After this recapitulation, which is intended to relieve the attention of the reader, shall we enter into more theories upon this subject? That of Dr. Briggs, first published in England, in the Philosophical Transactions, afterwards in Latin, under the title of Nova Visionis Theoria, with a prefatory epistle of Sir Isaac Newton to the author, amounts to this, that the fibres of the optic nerves passing from corresponding points of the retinae to the thalami nervorum opticorum, having the same length, the same tension, and a similar situation, will have the same tone, and therefore their vibrations, excited by the impression of the rays of light, will be like unisons in music, and will present one and the same image to the mind. But the fibres passing from parts of the retinae which do not correspond, having different tensions and tones, will have discordant vibrations, and therefore present different images to the mind. I shall not enter upon a particular examination of this theory. It is enough to observe, in general, that it is a system of conjectures concerning things of which we are entirely ignorant, and that all such theories in philosophy deserve rather to be laughed at than to be seriously refuted. From the first dawn of philosophy to this day it hath been believed that the optic nerves are intended to carry the images of visible objects from the bottom of the eye to the mind, and that the nerves belonging to the organs of the other senses have a like office. But how do we know this? We conjecture it, and, taking this conjecture for a truth, we consider how the nerves may best answer this purpose. The system of the nerves for many ages was taken to be a hydraulic engine, consisting of a bundle of pipes which carry to and fro a liquor called animal spirits. About the time of Dr. Briggs it was thought rather to be a stringed instrument, composed of vibrating cords, each of which had its proper tension and tone. But some, with as great probability, conceived it to be a wind instrument, which played its part by the vibrations of an elastic ether in the nervous fibrils. These, I think, are all the engines into which the nervous system hath been moulded by philosophers for conveying the images of sensible things from the organ to the sensorium. And, for all that we know of the matter, every man may freely choose which he thinks fittest for the purpose. For, from fact and experiment, no one of them can claim preference to another. Indeed, they all seem so unhandy engines for carrying images, that a man would be tempted to invent a new one. Since, therefore, a blind man may guess as well in the dark as one that sees, I beg leave to offer another conjecture touching the nervous system, which I hope will answer the purpose as well as those we have mentioned, and which recommends itself by its simplicity. Why may not the optic nerves, for instance, be made up of empty tubes, opening their mouths wide enough to receive the rays of light, which form the image upon the retina, and gently conveying them safe and in their proper order to the very seat of the soul, until they flash in her face. It is easy for ingenious philosopher to fit the calibre of these empty tubes to the diameter of the particles of light, 
so as they shall receive no grosser kind of matter. And if these rays should be in danger of mistaking their way, an expedient may also be found to prevent this, for it requires no more than to bestow upon the tubes of the nervous system a peristaltic motion like that of the alimentary tube. It is a peculiar advantage of this hypothesis that although all philosophers believe that the species or images of things are conveyed by the nerves to the soul, yet none of their hypotheses shew how this may be done. For how can the images of sound, taste, smell, color, figure, and all sensible qualities be made out of the vibrations of musical chords, or the undulations of animal spirits, or of ether? We ought not to suppose means inadequate to the end. Is it not as philosophical and more intelligible to conceive that as the stomach receives its food, so the soul receives her images by a kind of nervous degulation? I might add that we need only continue this peristaltic motion of the nervous tubes from the sensorium to the extremities of the nerves that serve the muscles, in order to account for the muscular motion. Thus nature will be consonant to herself, and as sensation will be the conveyance of the ideal element to the mind, so muscular motion will be the expulsion of the recommenditious part of it. For who can deny that the images of things conveyed by sensation may, after due concoction, become fit to be thrown off by muscular motion? I only give hints of these things to the ingenious, hoping that in time this hypothesis may be wrought up into a system as truly philosophical as that of animal spirits or the vibration of nervous fibres. To be serious, in the operations of nature, I hold the theories of a philosopher, which are unsupported by fact, in the same estimation with the dreams of a man asleep, or the ravings of a madman. We laugh at the Indian philosopher, who, to account for the support of the earth, contrived the hypothesis of a huge elephant, and to support the elephant a huge tortoise. If we will candidly confess the truth, we know as little of the operation of the nerves as he did of the manner in which the earth is supported, and our hypotheses about animal spirits, or about the tension and vibration of the nerves, are as like to be true as his about the support of the earth. His elephant was a hypothesis, and our hypotheses are elephants. Every theory in philosophy which is built on pure conjecture is an elephant, and every theory that is supported partly by fact, and partly by conjecture, is like Nebuchadnezzar's image, whose feet were partly of iron and partly of clay. The great Newton first gave an example to philosophers which always ought to be, but rarely hath been, followed. By distinguishing his conjectures from his conclusions, and putting the former by themselves in the modest form of queries. This is fair and legal, but all other philosophical traffic and conjecture ought to be held contraband and illicit. Indeed, his conjectures have commonly more foundation in fact, and more verisimilitude than the dogmatic theories of most other philosophers. And therefore we ought not to omit that which he hath offered concerning the cause of our seeing objects single with two eyes, in the fifteenth century annexed to his optics. Are not the species of objects seen with both eyes united, where the optic nerves meet, before they come into the brain, the fibres on the right side of both nerves uniting there, and after union going thence into the brain, in the nerve which is on the right side of the head, and the fibres on the left side of both nerves uniting in the same place, and after union going into the brain, in the nerve which is on the left side of the head, and these two nerves meeting in the brain in such a manner that their fibres make but one entire species or picture half of which on the right side of the sensorium comes from the right side of both eyes, through the right side of both optic nerves, to the place where the nerves meet, and from thence on the right side of the head into the brain, and the other half on the left side of the sensorium comes in like manner from the left side of both eyes. 
for the optic nerves of such animals as look the same way with both eyes as men dogs sheep oxen and etc meet before they come into the brain but the optic nerves of such animals as do not look the same way with both eyes as of fishes and the chameleon do not meet and if i am rightly informed i beg leave to distinguish this query into two which are of very different natures one being purely anatomical the other relating to the carrying species or pictures of visible objects to the sensorium the first question is whether the fibres coming from the corresponding points of the two retinae do not unite at the place where the optic nerves meet and continue united from thence to the brain so that the right optic nerve after the meeting of the two nerves is composed of the fibres coming from the right side of both retinae and the left of the fibres coming from the left side of both retinae this is undoubtedly a curious and rational question because if we could find ground from anatomy to answer it in the affirmative it would lead us a step forward in discovering the cause of the correspondence and sympathy which there is between certain points of the two retinae for although we know not what is the particular function of the optic nerves yet it is probable that some impression made upon them and communicated along their fibres is necessary to vision and whatever be the nature of this impression if two fibres are united into one an impression made upon one of them or upon both may probably produce the same effect anatomists think it a sufficient account of a sympathy between two parts of the body when they are served by branches of the same nerve we should therefore look upon it as an important discovery in anatomy if it were found that the same nerve sent branches to the corresponding points of the retinae but hath any such discovery been made no not so much as in one subject as far as i can learn but in several subjects the contrary seems to have been discovered dr porterfield hath given us two cases at length from vesalius and one from Cassilipinus, wherein the optic nerves after touching one another as usual appeared to be reflected back to the same side whence they came without any mixture of their fibres each of these persons had lost an eye some time before his death and the optic nerve belonging to that eye was shrunk, so that it could be distinguished from the other at the place where they met. Another case, which the same author gives, from Vesalius, is still more remarkable, for in it the optic nerves do not touch at all, and yet upon inquiry those who were most familiar with the person in his lifetime declared that he never complained of any defect of sight, or of his seeing objects double. Diemerbrook tells us that Aquapendens and Valverde likewise affirm that they have met with subjects wherein the optic nerves did not touch. As these observations were made before Sir Isaac Newton put this query, it is uncertain whether he was ignorant of them, or whether he suspected some inaccuracy in them, and desired that the matter might be more carefully examined. But from the following passage of the most accurate Winslow, it does not appear that later observations have been more favourable to his conjecture. The union of these optic nerves by the small curvatures of their cornua is very difficult to be unfolded in human bodies. This union is commonly found to be very close, but in some subjects it seems to be no more than a strong adhesion, in others to be partly made by an intersection of crossing of fibres they have been found quite separate and in other subjects one of them has been found to be very much altered both in size and colour through its whole passage the other remaining in its natural state when we consider this conjecture of sir isaac newton by itself it appears more ingenious and to have more verisimilitude than anything that has been offered upon the subject and we admire the caution and modesty of the author in proposing it only as a subject of inquiry but when we compare it with the observations of anatomists which contradict it we are naturally led to this reflection 
that if we trust to the conjectures of men of the greatest genius in the operation of nature, we have only the chance of going wrong in an ingenious manner. The second part of the query is whether the two species of objects from the two eyes are not, at the place where the optic nerves meet, united into one species or picture, half of which is carried thence to the sensorium in the right optic nerve, and the other half in the left. Whether these two halves are not so put together again at the sensorium as to make one species or picture? Here it seems natural to put the previous question. What reason have we to believe that pictures of objects are at all carried to the sensorium, either by the optic nerves or by any other nerves? Is it not possible that this great philosopher, as well as many of a lower form, having been led into this opinion at first by education, may have continued in it because he never thought of calling it in question? I confess this was my own case for a considerable part of my life but since i was led by accident to think seriously what reason i had to believe it i could find none at all it seems to be a mere hypothesis as much as the indian philosopher's elephant i am not conscious of any pictures of external objects in my sensorium any more than in my stomach the things which i perceive by my senses appear to be external and not in any part of the brain and my sensations, properly so called, have no resemblances of external objects. The conclusion from all that hath been said, in no less than seven sections upon our seeing objects single with two eyes, is this, that, by an original property of human eyes, objects painted upon the centres of the two retinae, or upon points similarly situate with regard to the centres, appear in the same visible place, that the most plausible attempts to account for this property of the eye have been unsuccessful, and therefore that it must be either a primary law of our constitution, or the consequence of some more general law which is not yet discovered. We have now finished what we intended to say, both of the visible appearances of things to the eye, and of the laws of our constitution by which those appearances are exhibited. But it was observed in the beginning of this chapter that the visible appearances of objects serve only as signs of their distance, magnitude, figure, and other tangible qualities. The visible appearance is that which is presented to the mind by nature according to those laws of our constitution which have been explained. But the thing signified by that appearance is that which is presented to the mind by custom. When one speaks to us in a language that is familiar, we hear certain sounds, and this is all the effect that his discourse has upon us by nature. But by custom we understand the meaning of these sounds, and therefore we fix our attention not upon the sounds, but upon the things signified by them. In like manner, we see only the visible appearance of objects by nature, but we learn by custom to interpret these appearances and to understand their meaning. And when this visual language is learned and becomes familiar, we attend only to the things signified, and cannot without great difficulty attend to the signs by which they are presented. The mind passes from one to the other so rapidly and so familiarly that no trace of the sign is left in the memory, and we seem immediately, and without the intervention of any sign, to perceive the thing signified. When I look at the apple-tree, which stands before my window, I perceive at the first glance its distance and magnitude, the roughness of its trunk, the disposition of its branches, the figure of its leaves and fruit. I seem to perceive all these things immediately. The visible appearance which presented them all to the mind has entirely escaped me. I cannot, without great difficulty and painful abstraction, attend to it, even when it stands before me. Yet it is certain that this visible appearance only is presented to my eye by nature, and that I learned by custom to collect all the rest from it. If I had never seen before now, I should not perceive either the distance or tangible figure of the tree, 
and it would have required the practice of seeing for many months to change that original perception which nature gave me by my eyes into that which I now have by custom. The objects which we see naturally and originally, as hath been before observed, hath length and breadth, but no thickness nor distance from the eye. Custom, by a kind of legerdemain, withdraws gradually from these original and proper objects of sight, and substitutes in their place objects of touch, which have length, breadth, and thickness, and a determinate distance from the eye. By what means this change is brought about, and what principles of the human mind concur in it, we are next to inquire. Section 20. Of Perception in General. Sensation and the perception of external objects by the senses, though very different in their nature, have commonly been considered as one and the same thing. The purposes of common life do not make it necessary to distinguish them, and the received opinions of philosophers tend rather to confound them. But without attending carefully to this distinction, it is impossible to have any just conception of the operations of our senses. The most simple operations of the mind admit not of a logical definition. All we can do is to describe them, so as to lead those who are conscious of them in themselves to attend to them and reflect upon them, and it is often very difficult to describe them so as to answer this intention. The same mode of expression is used to denote sensation and perception and therefore we are apt to look upon them as things of the same nature. Thus I feel a pain, I see a tree. The first denoteth a sensation, the last a perception. The grammatical analysis of both expressions is the same, for both consist of an active verb and an object. But if we attend to the thing signified by these expressions, we shall find that in the first the distinction between the act and the object is not real, but grammatical. In the second the distinction is not only grammatical, but real. The form of the expression, I feel pain, might seem to imply that the feeling is something distinct from the pain felt. Yet in reality there is no distinction as thinking a thought is an expression which would signify no more than thinking, so feeling a pain signifies no more than being pained. What we have said of pain is applicable to every other mere sensation. It is difficult to give instances, very few of our sensations having names, and where they have the same being common to the sensation and to something else which is associated with it. But when we attend to the sensation by itself, and separate it from other things which are conjoined with it, in the imagination, it appears to be something which can have no existence, but in a sentient mind, no distinction from the act of the mind by which it is felt. Perception, as we here understand it, hath always an object distinct from the act by which it is perceived, an object which may exist whether it be perceived or not. I perceive a tree that grows before my window. There is here an object which is perceived, and an act of the mind by which it is perceived. And these two are not only distinguishable, but they are extremely unlike in their natures. The object is made up of a trunk, branches, and leaves. But the act of the mind by which it is perceived hath neither trunk, branches, nor leaves. I am conscious of this act of my mind, and I can reflect upon it but it is too simple to admit of an analysis, and I cannot find proper words to describe it. I find nothing that resembles it so much as the remembrance of the tree, or the imagination of it. Yet both these differ essentially from the perception. They differ likewise one from another. It is in vain that a philosopher assures me that the imagination of the tree the remembrance of it and the perception of it are all one and differ only in degree of vivacity. I know the contrary, for I am as well acquainted with all the three as I am with the apartments of my own house. I know this also, that the perception of an object implies both a conception of its form and a belief of its present existence. 
I know, moreover, that this belief is not the effect of argumentation and reasoning. It is the immediate effect of my constitution. I am aware that this belief which I have in perception stands exposed to the strongest batteries of skepticism, but they make no great impression upon it. The skeptic asks me, why do you believe the existence of the external object which you perceive? This belief, sir, is none of my manufacture. It came from the mint of nature. It bears her image, and subscription, and if it is not right, the fault is not mine. I even took it upon trust and without suspicion. Reason, says the skeptic, is the only judge of truth, and you ought to throw off every opinion and every belief that is not grounded on reason. Why, sir, should I believe the faculty of reason more than that of perception? They came both out of the same shop, and were made by the same artist. And if he puts one piece of false ware into my hands, what should it hinder him from putting another? Perhaps the skeptic will agree to distrust reason, rather than give any credit to perception. For, says he, since by your own concession, the object which you perceive, and the act of your mind, by which you perceive it, are quite different things. The one may exist without the other, and as the object may exist without being perceived, so the perception may exist without an object. There is nothing shameful in a philosopher as to be deceived and deluded. And, therefore, you ought to resolve firmly to withhold assent, and to throw off this belief of external objects which may be all delusion. For my part, I will never attempt to throw it off. And although the sober part of mankind will not be very anxious to know my reasons, yet if they can be of use to any skeptic, they are these. First, because it is not in my power, why then should I make a vain attempt? it would be agreeable to fly to the moon, and to make a visit to Jupiter and Saturn. But when I know that nature has bound me down by the law of gravitation to this planet, which I inhabit, I rest contented, and quietly suffer myself to be carried along in its orbit. My belief is carried along by perception, as irresistibly as my body by the earth. And the greatest skeptic will find himself to be in the same condition." He may struggle hard to disbelieve the information of his senses, as a man does to swim against a torrent. But, ah, it is in vain. It is in vain that he strains every nerve and wrestles with nature, and with every object that strikes upon his senses. For, after all, when his strength is spent in the fruitless attempt, he will be carried down the torrent with the common herd of believers. Secondly, I think it would not be prudent to throw off this belief, if it were in my power. If nature intended to deceive me, and impose upon me by false appearances, and I, by my great cunning and profound logic, have discovered the imposture, prudence would dictate to me in this case even to put up this indignity done me as quietly as I could, and not to call her an impostor to her face, lest she should be even with me in another way. For what do I gain by resenting this injury? You ought at least not to believe what she says. This indeed seems reasonable, if she intends to impose upon me. But what is the consequence? I resolve not to believe my senses. I break my nose against a post that comes in my way. I step into a dirty kennel, and after twenty such wise and rational actions, I am taken up and clapped into a madhouse. Now I confess I would rather make one of the credulous fools whom nature imposes upon than of those wise and rational philosophers who resolve to withhold assent at all this experience. If a man pretends to be a skeptic with regard to the informations of sense, and yet prudently keeps out of harm's way as other men do, he must excuse my suspicion that he either acts the hypocrite or imposes upon himself. For if the scale of his belief were so evenly poised as to lean no more to one side than to the contrary, it is impossible that his actions could be directed by any rules of common prudence. Thirdly, although the two reasons already mentioned are perhaps two more than enough, I shall offer a third. I give in pleasant belief to the informations of nature 
by my senses, for a considerable part of my life, before I had learned so much logic as to be able to start a doubt concerning them. And now, when I reflect upon what is past, I do not find that I have been imposed upon by this belief. I find that without it I must have perished by a thousand accidents. I find that without it I should have been no wiser now than when I was born. I should not even have been able to acquire that logic which suggests these skeptical doubts with regard to my senses. Therefore I consider this instructive belief as one of the best gifts of nature. I thank the author of my being, who bestowed it upon me, before the eyes of my reason were opened, and still bestows it upon me to be my guide, where reason leaves me in the dark. And now I yield to the direction of my senses, not from instinct only, but from confidence and trust in a faithful and beneficent monitor, grounded upon the experience of his paternal care and goodness. In all this I deal with the author of my being no otherwise than I thought it reasonable to deal with my parents and tutors. I believed by instinct whatever they told me, long before I had the idea of a lie, or thought of the possibility of their deceiving me. Afterwards, upon reflection, I found they had acted like fair and honest people, who wished me well. I found that if I had not believed what they told me, before I could give a reason of my belief, I had to this day been little better than a changeling. And although this natural credulity hath sometimes occasioned my being imposed upon by deceivers, yet it hath been of infinite advantage to me upon the whole. Therefore I consider it as another good gift of nature. And I continue to give that credit from reflection to those of whose integrity and veracity I have had experience, which before I gave from instinct. There is a much greater similitude than is commonly imagined between the testimony of nature given by our senses and the testimony of men given by language. The credit we give to both is at first the effect of an instinct only. When we grow up and begin to reason about them, the credit given to human testimony is restrained and weakened by the experience we have of deceit. But the credit given to the testimony of our senses is established and confirmed by the uniformity and constancy of the laws of nature. Our perceptions are of two kinds. Some are natural and original, others acquired and the fruit of experience. When I perceive that this is the taste of cider, that of brandy, that this is the smell of an apple, that of an orange, that this is the noise of thunder, that the ringing of bells, this the sound of a coach passing, that the voice of such a friend, these perceptions and others of the same kind are not original, they are acquired. But the perception which I have by touch of the hardness and softness of bodies, of their extension, figure, and motion, is not acquired, it is original. In all our senses the acquired perceptions are many more than the original, especially in sight. By this sense we perceive originally the visible figure and color of bodies only, and their visible place, but we learn to perceive by the eye almost everything which we can perceive by touch. The original perceptions of this sense serve only as signs to introduce the acquired. The signs by which objects are presented to us in perception are the language of nature to man, and as in many respects it hath great affinity with the language of man to man, so particularly in this, that both are partly natural and original, partly acquired by custom. Our original or natural perceptions are analogous to the natural language of man to man, of which we took notice in the fourth chapter, and our acquired perceptions are analogous to artificial language, which in our mother tongue is got very much in the same manner with our acquired perceptions, as we shall afterwards more fully explain. Not only men, but children, idiots, and brutes, acquire by habit many perceptions which they had not originally. Almost every employment in life hath perceptions of this kind that are peculiar to it, the shepherd knows every sheep of his flock, as we do our acquaintance, and can pick them out of another flock one by one. 
The butcher knows by sight the weight and quality of his beeves and sheep before they are killed. The farmer perceives by his eye very nearly the quantity of hay in a rick, or of corn in a heap. The sailor sees the burden, the built, and the distance of a ship at sea, while she is a great way off. Every man accustomed to writing distinguishes his acquaintance by their handwriting, as he does by their faces, and the painter distinguishes in the works of his art the style of all the great masters. In a word, acquired perception is very different in different persons, according to the diversity of objects about which they are employed, and the application they bestow in observing them. Perception ought not only to be distinguished from sensation, but likewise from that knowledge of objects of sense which is got by reasoning. There is no reasoning in perception, as hath been observed. The belief which is implied in it is the effect of instinct. But there are many things with regard to sensible objects which we can infer from what we perceive, and such conclusions of reason ought to be distinguished from what is merely perceived. When I look at the moon, I perceive her to be sometimes circular, sometimes horned, and sometimes gibbous. This is simple perception, and is the same in the philosopher and in the clown. But from these various appearances of her enlightened part, I infer that she is really of a spherical figure. This conclusion is not obtained by simple perception, but by reasoning. Simple perception has the same relation to the conclusions of reason drawn from our perceptions as the axioms in mathematics have to the propositions. I cannot demonstrate that two quantities which are equal to the same quantity are equal to each other. Neither can I demonstrate that the tree which I perceive exists. But by the constitution of my nature, my belief is irresistibly carried along by my apprehension of the axiom, and by the constitution of my nature. My belief is no less irresistibly carried along by my perception of the tree. All reasoning is from principles. The first principles of mathematical reasoning are mathematical axioms and definitions, and the first principles of all our reasoning about existences are our perceptions. The first principles of every kind of reasoning are given us by nature, and are of equal authority with the faculty of reason itself, which is also the gift of nature. The conclusions of reason are all built upon first principles, and can have no other foundation. Most justly, therefore, do such principles disdain to be tried by reason, and laugh at all the artillery of the logician when it is directed against them. When a long train of reasoning is necessary in demonstrating a mathematical proposition, it is easily distinguished from an axiom, and they seem to be things of a very different nature. But there are some propositions which lie so near to axioms that it is difficult to say whether they ought to be held as axioms or demonstrated as propositions. The same thing holds with regard to perception, and the conclusions drawn from it. Some of these conclusions follow our perceptions so easily, and are so immediately connected with them, that it is difficult to fix the limit which divides the one from the other. Perception, whether original or acquired, implies no exercise of reason, and is common to men, children, idiots, and brutes. The more obvious conclusions drawn from our perceptions by reason make what we call common understanding, by which men conduct themselves in the common affairs of life, and by which they are distinguished from idiots. The more remote conclusions which are drawn from our perceptions by reason make what we commonly call science, in the various parts of nature, whether in agriculture, medicine, mechanics, or in any part of natural philosophy. When I see a garden in good order, containing a great variety of things of the best kinds, and in the most flourishing condition, I immediately conclude, from these signs, the skill and industry of the gardener. A farmer, when he rises in the morning, and perceives that the neighboring brook overflows his field, concludes that a great deal of rain hath fallen in the night. Perceiving his fence broken, and his corn trodden down, he concludes that some of his own, or his neighbor's cattle, have broke loose. 
perceiving that his stable door is broke open, and some of his horses gone, he concludes that a thief has carried them off. He traces the prints of his horse's feet in the soft ground, and by them discovers which road the thief hath taken. There are instances of common understanding which dwells so near to perception that it is difficult to trace the line which divides the one from the other. In like manner, the science of nature dwells so near to common understanding that we cannot discern where the latter ends and the former begins. I perceive that bodies, lighter than water, swim in water, and that those which are heavier sink. Hence I conclude that if a body remains, wherever it is put under water, whether at the top or bottom, it is precisely of the same weight with water. If it were rest only when part of it is above water, it is lighter than water. And the greater the part above water is compared with the whole, the lighter is the body. If it had no gravity at all, it would make no impression upon the water, but stand wholly above it. Thus every man, by common understanding, has a rule by which he judges of the specific gravity of bodies which swim in water, and a step or two more leads him into the science of hydrostatics. All that we know of nature, or of existence, may be compared to a tree which have its root, trunk, and branches. In this tree of knowledge, perception is the root, common understanding is the trunk, and the sciences are the branches. End of chapter 6, part 5 Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham, Connecticut